when we left. Um, <laughs> and yeah. So um, it's uh, what I did was I went to a reunion of um, dancers, of Tiller Girl dancers in Blackpool in 2019, and it was in a fancy hotel in Blackpool. And so I walked in with Helena, this filmmaker. She like mic'd me up. She had a camera, so it meant I didn't need to worry about the uh, video making aspects. She's really good at kind of creating really great images on the fly, like getting the video. Um, and I just kind of integrated myself into this room full of older women and I just kind of sat down and asked them questions, asked them to show me their photograph albums that they'd brought with them. And it's like when I was in that room and I entered this room and we all had this fancy meal, like I asked the tillers if I could come, like a Bernie Tiller, the grandson, the, you know, a descendant of the, of the original John Tiller. And he said I could go and so we have this fancy meal and I was trying to make a fancy meal. Um, and it's like, when I walked into this room, I was like, in this room of glamorous older women, and I was like, this is amazing. This is just like nothing I have ever seen before in my life. You know, I've never seen a room full of glamorous older women. And, um, and it was hilarious and, and really like um, tender, but also pathos inducing because, you know, what comes over in their storytelling is that they've had incredible experiences and really rich and interesting lives, but have also, even though they've been mixing with celebrities and being kind of stars and like mainstream known stars in particular eras, their faces aren't known. So then their individual personality isn't well known, although they, they have this cachet and they have this kind of prestige and wealth. Um, they could never find a place. They couldn't go back. You know, they were always like ruptured from their background. Most of them were working class, and they had experiences that meant their families never really um, could get them again. They'd crossed a threshold, and they couldn't go back. Um, and also, it meant that they had a financial independence that their peers did not have, and a, and a, a kind of a capacity to travel which their peers didn't have. So a lot, of, like one of my favourite stories is this older woman. She says, um, "I've had three wedding dresses. I've never worn one." <laughs> and um, there's this sense of, you know, like, like what what do you do when you see the world? What and also, you know, there's there's this sense that. <coughs> They, they, they were managing like sexual harassment that they couldn't even, that they didn't name. And it's not part of their vocabulary to say part of my job was being sexually harassed. Um, but that like comes up, that comes up in their disclosures of their lives. Um, they, they kind of were in some ways, um, you know, objectified in ways they completely understood. They weren't naive about their jobs. Um, this is part of what they did. They were paid, they were fine with it. But all of these things they were negotiating because they were part of a sisterhood. And so it's really interesting, you know, their, their, their self-ownership of the good and the bad is, is just really moving. You can tell that they don't even, they know that they've had such an amazing life. They don't even want to, like, unpack their darker experiences as darker experiences. It is part of the deal. Um, and they navigated this deal by having this sisterhood. And so, yeah, glamorous older people who are kind of um, self-determined subjects. Over to you. Oh, <laughs> you. <laughs> I mean, how 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 do you how do you work with that? Glamorous older people. Yeah, it's, with that self-determined aspect that you're interested in. That. Yeah, so I kind of take things from a different angle. So I'm looking at aging fetishists. Um, still in the same way kind of living that life to a certain extent um so i'm interviewing uh people over the age of 65 who like to wear rubber like to wear latex um i've spoken to a couple of old gentlemen recently um 85 and 75 year olds who are still part of that scene and i think it's really interesting from going from the female perspective to the male perspective and a lot of what's wrapped up in the fetish scene in terms of wearing latex is um, also combined with sexual desire. Um, and what I find really interesting about the oral history side of things and 
I think the older generation are very much really, you know, really happy to tell you their story, including those intimate details. Obviously, slightly different with you know not wanting to unpack certain things. Um, the chaps I've been talking to are very happy to show you certain bits of kit that they've got or tell you about their experiences that they've had with certain things. Um, but also then that as age has caught up with them, how they don't get that same pleasure from either wearing or the rubber being a stimulating element. Um, but in the same way, you know, it's, it's kind of them looking back at or remembering those experiences. Um, and I don't know, you, you'll talk about like the cop and you talk about costumes and things like that. And they talk about, you know, wearing a latex cat suit as, it, as if it's an old friend and they can, they can feel part of that experience again. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's, it, we just started having a really good discussion, actually. So some good questions. Yeah, um, that's really yeah. interesting about, you know, um, one of the dancers, I went to her house and I interviewed her in her house. And, um, you know, I absolutely love her. She's called Bez. She came to the screen mm. in February. And Bez, like, when she realised what I was doing in filming, she said to me, and I just love, I love a cheeky, I love cheeky people. She went, can you come to one of my talks and film it and give me the footage? And I was like, yes, <laughs> so I'll do that. So I go, so like, you know, I interview her in her house. Um, and then another occasion, I went to her house and she said, and she lives in Blackpool. And she said to me, you can stay overnight uh, and then we'll go to my talk and you can film my talk. And, um, and her talk was happened to be at the Grand Theatre in Blackpool and I've always wanted to photograph there and I've never been able to get permission. And so anyway, she goes, oh, I know them there, I know them there. So she got me in, so I was able to photograph. So I stayed overnight, I filmed her thing, I gave the footage and I photographed the theatre and I could never get permission without <laughs> Bess. So um, I saw her get ready for this talk and it was kind of amazing because it was like her like makeup routine and setting her hair and getting her hair already. It's like she still was really like invested in, in like looking glamorous. And you'll see on on the film, you know, that the the women, it's like they they just they're so used to just putting their makeup on and like doing their hair. Mm. It's just so them. And it's like you, you see these women who are between like 70s and 90s. Mm. And they're so polished. I mean, like they're so dapper looking. Like one of the the best looking. Um, she's got this like red bow tie, this red um, suit on, and she's got a bob. You know, she's so like pristine. It's like it's it's part of how they're sharp in the world. It's part of that. You know, it's just like thinking about that kind of how you make yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and kind of on the flip side, because the people I've been speaking to have families who don't know that they're part of this scene and so they're really prepared to tell you all their inner most darkest secrets yet their children mm -hmm. or their you know children don't know about it so in the same sort of way I got offered to go and stay um, at my 85 year old's house um, and uh, actually, I didn't. I stayed in the premiere in down the road because his friend, <laughs> his friend ended up coming. <laughs> so um, I stayed down the road uh, and worked late, so that was fine. Um, but I went in the morning, and he was like, "Right, for supper, would you? We're going to have prawn cocktail, and then we're going to have some cold meats, and then we're going to have dessert and things like that." So it was really nice. It was that real kind of normality and hospitality and that sort of thing. And then he was like, "And then tomorrow." I'm going to get out the back bed so you can have a go in that and see what it's like. In a, so a back bed is basically um, a bag made of latex on a frame and you kind of have a either a tube to breathe in and out of and then they suck all the air out of it. So you like vacuum packed meat, essentially. Um, and then he had a inflatable coffin, so um, which kind of then kind of squashes you in another way. So, so we'll try that, we'll try that. And then you can go through my wardrobe and I'll tell you about that. But it's that kind of want isn't it? Oh, you, you kind of see their eyes light up when they get into that zone of 
what they're used to. I suppose yeah. and it's I suppose different, slightly different to glamming up or yeah. <laughs> in both instances, they're a bit for like a past self. Mm. But also, you know, when you talk about the fashion pageant, yes. it makes me think about, and particularly the the coffin, it makes me think about you know how you can get weighted blankets yeah. now at the Euro Divergent, you know, mm. like that comfort. So it's like it's interesting, like mm. the the kinds of uh, comfort embedded in um, fetish experiences. And that's what one of the guys was saying, was he, you can't get into this, so it's it's like a big sack that blows up all around you and then they've got big straps on. I get a little bit claustrophobic, so I was a little bit nervous, but it was mm-hmm. fine. And once you're in, because there's kind of rubber over your ears as well, it muffles it, so you do feel really secure. And one of the guys said, oh, I can, I can lie in it for hours. I'll just, and, and these two guys, don't, they're, not, they're not in a relationship of any kind, apart from friendship. Um, but he'll go down, one's from the Midlands and one lives in Cornwall, so he'll go down and they'll put each other in the back bed or they'll put each other in an inflatable coffin and just leave them for a couple of hours to just meditate, essentially. And I think it is that wellness experience as, as well. And, uh, looking at Bishop's Gate Archive, who I'm working with at the moment, looking through some of their old brochures and catalogues from like the 50s, it's you know latex is sold as a health benefit to sweat out all your impurities, or you know there's a lot to do with women and women wearing latex about it being you know a health benefit rather, and they and they talk about it as like a um, like a silk material, or so they, they jazz it up in different ways, which is quite interesting. But it's nice to see how um, my participants talk about it, so my older participants, and the brands that they're talking about, and then you can kind of um, find material in the archive to, I suppose, corroborate or to mm. kind of see what they were looking at when they were mail-ordering things and mm. typed up catalogs and all that. That's really interesting. When they're talking to you, are they, like, are they using the, like, the, the, the indirectness of the fetish to talk about their sexuality, or are they really sexually explicit? So the majority of conversations we've had are about their own sexual experiences within... Oh, that's a good question. So they talk about themselves and how they use latex to, I'm going to use a really crass term, but get themselves off, um, or kind of what they use in, within their latex play, so different machines or things like that. So they're quite happy, happy to talk about that. On the flip side... Um, one of my participants has been married twice, both his partners didn't have an interest in it. And so, how he talks about himself and how he talks about like his relationships is quite interesting. Um, but it's always to do with the latex. There's that kind of direct, um, directness, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Um, like, when you put the latex on, how you feel, you know, you become empowered. And, you know, wearing this tonight, I kind of, you know, I always feel like quite glam or quite like, okay, um, it's, it's, power, it's power dressing in a way, maybe. Um, so when they're kind of zipping themselves into their tight cat suits or whatever, the tighter the better and all of that sort of thing, it gives them that feeling or gives them that buzz, but they can't get over the line now sort of thing. But they still get, it's the memories, It's they go back to the memories of what it was like or what it is like. Yeah, because there's two things that strike me about the difference with the kind of people that I talk to. Mm. And what, one is just the pleasure of the outfits. Yes. I mean, like, in the video, there's there's one of the really old women. She's called Vera, I think, yeah, Vera. And she's got this hilarious accent, this hilarious voice. And she goes, I felt very lovely in that. She's like, mm. I love wearing that. And um, she's, oh, yeah, and she goes, I felt very sexy. And she says this, she's hilarious. Uh, that is really her voice, um, so there's that, you know, she really, there's her pleasure in that but all those years ago. And many of them talk about the kinds of, you know, the boyfriends they've had, the kinds of lives they had. And clearly, like, inferred is their kind of their, well, the line that they're walking is that they were clearly subjected to the prejudices of being promiscuous mm. because they were treated like they were promiscuous. And therefore, like their stories are about that negotiation, but their stories are usually not disclosure of whether that was them or not. Yeah. So there isn't that sense of like telling me they were promiscuous or anything. 
and um, and I really don't know or couldn't speak to the Tiller girls, but I mean, they're traveling the world and, you know, they're living these independent lives, but it, that's not the kind of thing they're telling me about. I mean, they are telling me about their boyfriends. They, are, they were saying hilarious stories about boyfriends <laughs> and, you know, things that didn't work out or, or pe- you know, various things. It is very funny, but it's usually how people related to them rather than what they wanted. So they can't, they're, they're not speaking their own desire. Yeah. And I think that's, that's in some senses to do with the demographic mm. and to do with the ways that people projected onto them. I think it's difficult to cultivate a way of speaking uh, against that in a way that they felt that they had to present themselves as good girls, mm. even within this. Um, but a previous project I, I did with a, uh, a bluebell who was in her 90s and she was a chorus girl who travelled Europe in the 30s. She had performed in France, Germany, and Italy, and she loved Italy the best. And war broke out, which was in Italy, and she came home, and it was a perilous journey home. And um, she talked to me about her boyfriends and her liaisons, and I didn't quite like Like she said, um, like her Italian boyfriend was this old, much older man who was an architect, and he called her his last cup of champagne. Mm-hmm. And um, so there was this sense of, I don't know, a lot of men around mm-hmm. her, but you know, I, I, I didn't know what that meant. And then she passed away and I went to her funeral and I talked to her granddaughter who was similar mm-hmm. age to me. And um, she was like, did granny tell you about something? And she was like, did that granny tell you this? So I got to hear more about Felicity through her granddaughter. And um, then her granddaughter said that she had got ready to go out, she was just going to go out, and, and um, Felicity had said to her, are you stopping out all night <laughs> if you meet a boy? And, uh, and Alice was like, Granny, I'm not like that, you can't say that. And Felicity was like, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And it's so funny that in a sense, you know, I mean, I loved that um, story because I was really like, Oh, uh, yeah, all that, yeah, all those men they're talking about, you know, trying to cross your yeah, okay, I get it. But it's it's just really interesting um, that it's not part of that they that was part of their experience, but it wasn't part of what they disclosed to me. So it's like their sexual visibility and sexual availability is not something that they owned or spoke of, which is I think different yeah. when you're like, Okay, so your fetish, tell me about your fetish. But also, I wonder if there's a gender difference. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think that's true. But interesting, you say about oral histories and you know collecting those stories because my PhD project was collecting stories of lost love, and I interviewed a, an 85 year old woman, and she had gone on a university trip to um, Innsbruck, and they travelled through the war torn countries in the 50s, and um, she'd met a German who had been a soldier on the front line and she talked about it, you know, we could never be together because my parents would have agreed, so we had one night of passion, but we didn't do all of that because I wouldn't, you know, I wasn't allowed to. And she said, when I came home, we wrote to each other for months until the letters fizzled out. And she said, if it had been as easy as it is now, you know, to get on an easy jet plane or whatever, I would have been straight back to see her. And it was heartbreaking hearing some of these stories. And actually at her funeral, um, and as part of the eulogy, the family read it out and they hadn't, she hadn't said any of this to her family until this project came up. So her daughters had never known about the German courier. Mm. Um, and it's really nice. I, I don't know how you feel about, but do you feel like you're saving these stories to a certain extent as well um, that are going to disappear with time? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so Bernie Tiller, the descendant of the Tillers, mm-hmm. um, he saw my film and then he realised that like all of the Tiller Girl stories need set, need to be saved. So he put on, I mean, I don't know what's going on, but he put on his Facebook group, the Tillers, you know, because mm. there's this large Facebook group of ex-Tillers. Um, you know, he, he was like, we need to record these. And so they need, you know, these need to be filmed. And I don't know if he's found somebody to do this. Mm. And I was like, oh, I'd love to do it. But of course, it's always the case of money, you know. Um, it's not my name, you know, I'd, I like working with a filmmaker to record me and and I'd love to do it for free, but, you know, it's difficult. Um, but, I mean, I, I would, you know, I would be prepared to. But he hasn't got back to me, so I don't know what's going to happen. But, I, you know, also, like, I am good at this. I'm yeah. oral history trained yeah. and I'm, like, good at eliciting stories out of people. Um, and I'd love to get more. And, yeah, there, there is that uh, thing where you're like, I hope 
you know, Lord, I... I mean, I read... I mean, you know what I mean? Like, well, they are, obviously. But I read this memoir of a uh, tiller, um, and it was really difficult to trace her. I sort of traced her, but then it's like COVID break, broke out, and it's like I, I just couldn't fully get in touch with her, and I think she's passed away since. But the thing that was really interesting about her was she was raised in a real socialist family, and it was really embarrassing for her family um, because when she performed, like in that day and age, they would have the... Um, the national anthem mm. and like uh, people in the theatre would stand up for the national anthem well her family was so socialist that they refused to stand up so she found this really embarrassing um but also it meant that she actually had a, a kind of a, a socialist critique of the kinds of things that were going on around her that she was just very turned on like for example there were a lot of South African contracts and when she was offered to travel to South Africa to you know, dance in South Africa, she, she turned it down because of, the, um, because of apartheid and mm. the, the, the politics there. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I never captured her story. Yeah. I mean, you know, she wrote a memoir, so mm. it, it exists. It exists but yeah. Um, yeah, you know, obviously I want all of them. <laughs> yeah, but I know, it just feel like that. Yeah. It's like the same women. Yeah. And I was going to just ask you about the costume. So I suppose with fetish wear, obviously, going to certain kind of latex events, you, you see a lot of hooded people or, um, you know, in, in very kind of, I suppose, the classic gimp, black mask, black cat suit, that sort of look. So going to events, there's a lot of anonymity, but variation within mm. what people are wearing. But obviously the tillers have that very mm, uniform, uniform look. Do you think that kind of comes into part of... Like when you talk to them, are they kind of do they have more of a unity when they talk, or is that kind of like part of the girl code that they have? Well, I mean, they, you know, that they, they have a similar definition of glamour, so they mm. they 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 look similar. Yeah. But when they're together, you, you'll see. Um, but I mean, like the thing that's funny is that when they gather, they will always like stage a photograph, mm. and like the way that they line up together is where the. Uh, taller on the outside mm -hmm. and the smaller on the inside so it's like they they just know how to like do a lineup and um then what then like basically some of them were head ex-head girls mm -hmm. so the one who i said we had a red bow tie she was like a head girl so she would like shout out instructions on like the lineup discipline mm -hmm. so it was all in there this muscle memory and it's like they're all like you know so she's going she's going heads you know she's like telling her like heads this way you know your arms that way and they, they're all doing it and they're all completely like it's all muscle memory and in there so that kind of sense of you know you get enough tiller girls in the room and eventually they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna create some patterns some mm. physical patterns um so there's there's that but the other thing that i was thinking about that's interesting is that they're their look is very much about display and about that very much about their legs yeah um so in the 80s when the last generation of the you know the tillers had officially finished mm -hmm. so the final generation of tillers banded together and said let's be a troop so they weren't like there was no one sending them out yeah they, you know they had they had no agency um but they were like let's just keep doing it so they were called the tillers of the 80s because they were the last cohort um but they kind of got this out, so they were by this time, I guess they must have been in their 50s. Mm. Um, and their outfits were, and they they danced, They, I mean, they kept dancing for another like 20 years. Not often, yeah. but people would get them on for mm. things. And so their outfits would be, you know, leotards and, and coattails. Yeah. And so there were these women in their 50s in that you know in their leotards and I mean like one of the last one of the things that they did was Paul O'Grady they were on the Paul O'Grady show and Paul O'Grady as Lily Savage is a tiller girl and it's hilarious they're on YouTube and like Lily is being a hilarious tiller <laughs> but it works you know she works really hard at, at doing that um, but it is interesting that they didn't talk about it's like the, there's a lot of elephants in the room they didn't talk about the fact that they were an aging visible body. It's not something they could talk about. It's like, in a sense, the name mm -hmm. means something. It mean, It's like what they're doing is underneath this name and they don't need to either unpack it or talk to it or say what it is or take ownership of it. 
But you look at the pictures and they're clearly ageing women yeah. in leotards and it makes you think, how did you feel about that? Mm -hmm. And how did you feel about people's reactions? I mean, one of the things that they did um, latterly not performing is at the London Palladium, they would be meters and greeters in their leotards for like royal variety shows like big London Palladium events. So they would be there as a visible presence with their legs out and you're like, what was that like? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. How was that for you? Because, you know, like it's like this way in which they are, there are some repressions because they're not able to talk about some things, mm. but there's some things that, some things around bodily display that they're completely immune to. They're, they're like unable to even speak of it. It's like, well, we can't mix out, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it's part of what I do, you know, like, just get an exam. And of course, they're, you know, in many ways, they're not, um, you know, they can just get changed in front of anyone. They're not prudish, you know what I mean? Like, they really are, like, able to just show off and get their legs out and display themselves. And it's like, that's part of their muscle memory and who they are. Yeah. But, uh, but that's also not something they wouldn't say, this is what I do, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, I think subsequent generations, particularly when you look at... Um, you know, like the oldest generation of neo burlesque dancers now are in their fifties, and that group of women are very much like articulate around why they do it, why they take their clothes off. You know, their pleasure, how they put themselves together. But that is all premised on them doing something individually and setting up a scene around them. So it's just really interesting to see they don't speak of that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I went to a latex ball in June, mm. West Bromwich, um, in a um, swingers club, so I had to join the swingers club, which was interesting. <laughs> uh, I've got the card in my wallet. Uh, and so, going into that environment, you, um, there was protocol that you have to deal with, so you're not allowed to know about phones, um, so all of that kind of gets put in a bag at the start of the in like lockers when you go in and you can get changed in the toilets or you know take your big coat off or whatever you've got on when you get there but actually that idea of when you go in everyone is dressed in completely in the way that they want to be dressed so you know it could be boobs out it could be no bottoms you know anything goes and for that night which was really interesting um People are just kind of unashamedly happy with their bodies. There's no kind of pressure that you feel like you're being watched in any way. And it's that that idea of, you know, just being who you want to be. So there were people with the kind of anime heads. Um, there were people on, you know, on chains, um, in full masks. Um, and again, the sort of pleasure that people got from it with it being in a swingers club, which... Again, there's an eye opener. You could go down to the dungeon and you could go and have different pleasures, um, that sort of thing. And again, the age range was from 18 to 80. There was just a whole mix. And it's that idea of community and um, not, you know, you don't have to be a particular age or look a particular way. So, body shape, height, gender. Um, it's just such a nice community. And I think people don't realise that um, when you think of fetish you just think oh god people in scary black masks or that sort of thing and um, it's really interesting when you get involved in a community like you will have seen those Tiller girls as a kind of mirror image of everyone and you until you then start to what did we talk about like involve yourself in it or become embedded in that community it's only then you can kind of start to really get to know the people and and the types of people like a lot of, um, you know, high-powered business people or, you know, that kind of community, academics, um, doctors, etc., within the fetish community who people wouldn't maybe necessarily think. It's, it's a really varied yeah. thing. I, you know, and I think that these stories uh, are really important because I think that, you know, both of the kinds of stories were captured. I think plot precedents for, I mean, I think that over their lives, they experienced certain kinds of um, repressive norms, which are loosening. Yeah. But they were carving out their identities, their lives, their proclivities and their ways of earning, mm -hmm. you know, against these um, repressive norms. 
And I think it's really important that these, you know, it's so it, it's so easy for these to get lost, mm -hmm. and it makes a, a much easier, neater history if they are lost. But it's really interesting to keep hold of them mm. to kind of tell us something about the kinds of um, loosening of repression yeah. now. I think they're really valuable. And mm. um, mm. the other thing that I was kind of going to um, say, it looks like you're on it. the way, <laughs> we're really on the way. And so the next kind of really like important thing to say and maybe to, to like in, involve Rob is that um, in terms of like capturing these stories, they're like you know obviously I'm talking to older women and I'm, I'm using some footage but not trying to lean on it of um, the Tiller girls performing in their heyday, so archival footage. And I think that when people see my work they're really tempted to kind of key into other references and to see something that's archival or nostalgic or backward focus and or vintage and to think of a kind of a an aesthetic, you know, a sweetness or a cuteness and to box that off, you know, to stop thinking about the, you know, the things that I'm really interested in are um, like labour conditions, um, a kind of um, the move from working class to like travelling the world and what kind of tensions that creates, um, the realities of their lives, and to hold those things uppermost uh, over and above um, the images that look quite sweet. Um, I found um, that kind of uh, intervening on the sound is, a, is an interesting way of trying to make the images maybe read differently and be more apparent. So um, I've asked Rob to kind of score tonight. And do you want to talk about your process and the way you've worked with, with this? Um, well, we're just going to open the yeah. file. <laughs> 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 if you'd like to do a very short <laughs> intro, that'd be lovely. Oh, we can yeah. just go in and do yeah. that yeah, yeah. Just, make, <laughs> just introduce your uh, key instrument, I think. Yeah. So yeah, tell us what a nickel harper is. What so my work is largely for the nickel harper, uh, which is an ancient Swedish keyed fiddle and electronics. Um, it sounds very ethereal and looks very yeah, looks sort of like this. <laughs> yeah, kind of mad-looking thing. Keys, and it is a very traditional instrument. But I'm not a traditional musician. It's uh, originally a Swedish folk instrument, but as you can see. I'm not Swedish. Um, there's kind of like layers of connection which are like, like abstracted from the context in which you'd see this instrument, which is largely folk musicians in Sweden. Uh, for me, it's just about the sound of the instrument it has this amazing sonority. Um, and you, there aren't many outside of Sweden that are very, very uncommon. Um, and so, yeah, it's a couple of keys, and that's how you play it. Its closest relative is the hurdy gurdy. As a short bow, and a lot of the treatment you'll hear in the scoring of this work is processed versions of this, some fixed beforehand and some live during the performance, um, and kind of a mixture of improvised material that have woven into the, the film, um, which I think is really interesting because what I do with the music is kind of what you were just saying. There's no nostalgic treatment here. There's a lot of kind of processed material. It doesn't give you the opportunity to kind of, you know, lean on that kind of 1950s swing music, 40s, 30s, 20s, early 20th century kind of like jazz band kind of material. You don't get any of that. So it kind of pushes you forward. Thanks. That's a great Thank intro. Is it? <laughs>
this great talent to us different generations. I uh, know we always say we're the young ones, but we definitely not young now. <laughs> um, and there are to us here in Nightwitch who have travelled and know each other with us now and made a special effort to still us before me. And, you know, we're not getting any younger. So I said, big thank you for that.
Then you will throw some money back. Yeah. Or hair has to be very short. Yeah. And if you bounce the bell, yeah. it's far more behind the screen when the camera lights up. You know, um, if you wanted to change hair colour, you have to ask permission. And when, certainly when I joined, although it did last later, um, trousers were forbidden. Because ladies did not wear trousers. But we were permitted to wear white socks in the two side um, which was very good with, you know, with new girls and parents never would have to worry about an adult going away from her in such a young age. Um, what she used to do is she would bring one of the other girls back, you know, have some living with them. And that's the one in mind, you know, looking after a new girl. As far as I'm aware, I've never been used. I never quite know the people because I was on Manchester originally. Um, I was working in Manchester, but uh, some of them on the telephones would be staying with my parents. And probably next, well, they did, next door neighbour and then down the street. So she was very good that. Okay, got the new routine. 
Putin and before he left on Wednesday. Then Putin needed yesterday, he only did it. And at the end of the day, you we were doing a fire routine. I split. Put your head. You got the one wrong. So it's right over left over. So yeah, they can't make it. Right, so right over left over. So if you do your routine, then you can face the sun, you can get a step. Yeah, you can drop the car, face the sun, so you're on end the sun, then you pick up like that. Yeah, so there's no busyness from your eyes. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's how it was all work. Yeah, so slick. Yeah, those were so good. Yeah, that was so good. Do you still remember them? Yes, all right. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. 
it's a big flat you know. And um, we've got a double bed and a single bed. And the single bed goes from there. No. So we want a big double bed, single bed over there, like that. But when we have this, they want to see me up. No, I didn't see me there. And apparently, she sat up and she went to one of the other places. And what the phrase is called, what did you get? Well, it was um, wrong, wasn't it? He'd stayed the night, and he crept in the room and looked more. He got cold in the early hours, so he kept inching the bed, and the bed in off to try and keep warm. And I went in, so I was seeing the bed in, disappearing, and I said, and so how do I not get over here? <laughs> Anyway, I got up and I thought, oh, I'll go and clear up some of the voices. Mm -hmm. I went in and my mum was in the chair and my mum went, my mum was sat in the chair and the settee was facing, the mum was there, the settee was right here, facing the fire. So I looked at her, do you remember Freddie had a tight stadium? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Freddie was asleep on the settee. And I thought, oh, and we don't go to this day when we don't sleep at all. But my mum sat up talking to Freddie, <laughs> and I've seen Freddie sit, and he doesn't know we don't sleep at all. My mum in the chair, or he won't sit. And I thought, oh, no, upstairs. I went upstairs and we got there. We saw the Elsie sleep on the city and all that. And then we got him out, as we moved. My mum one day, she said, I didn't realize what a lovely she had. And then I sat and she said, and he was all in. It was me thinking, oh, almost me. It's not the time. She was like, I didn't think I was so big, imagining things, you know. That's you.
of where you want to go, or one point I want to go to Japan. So I sort of shopped around and decided about who was going to Japan. You know.
Yes, they to the side.
series of books. So that you know what we're talking about. <laughs> so and how old are you now? Uh, Eighteen. Well, well, the last one moved. So we said, oh, we should be back in the month. So like, uh, fifty years later. <laughs> I mean, I used to go back, but I never would. Yeah, I mean, it's very important. When did you start dancing stage? Well, the first pantomime that was sent to was uh, when I was 16 um, at the New Theatre in Oxford. That was a new theatre, it was a new theatre then. That was very nice, that was the Bertram on the New Theatre. And then the next one was um, in, in um, I don't know if that's a dance, the next one was um, Lee at Liverpool. Liverpool and Sunderland, and, 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 and then the following year, and I, I was back at the school again. I went to King's Theatre in Hammersmith with Clarks and Rose. He was a big, a big pantomime day. And then after that, I went to the one to um, went to the Chiller Old 